uh, and welcome to this talk in the VM Live series on reference architecture for virtualizing machine learning and AI infrastructure. Uh, my colleague Mohan Potheri and I will introduce ourselves in a second. We're both from technical marketing teams at VMware. And this is a very exciting topic for us to talk about. So I'm a, a technical marketing architect within the uh, cloud platform business unit. CPBU at VMware, the core vSphere unit, and you have my contact details there. You're welcome to fire a question at me on email. Um, my main focus for the past few years has been on machine learning alongside my colleague, my co-speaker, and on the enablement of partner solutions. We were constantly bringing partners into the labs here to test out their machine learning technology on VMware. Previously worked on Java and big data platforms, and before coming to VMware, I was at HP working on HBUX and x86 development. And I'll pass to my colleague Mohan to introduce himself now. Sorry. Okay, sorry, uh, I was on mute. So uh, I'm Mohan Poteri, I'm a staff solutions architect. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm with the uh, also doing technical marketing, focusing on machine learning and AI. Uh, I have a lot of industry experience uh, in the IT infrastructure. And uh, a lot of my focus has been on um, business critical apps and enterprises. So today uh, we hope to uh, educate you on uh, the MLAI and what, what uh, reference architecture for MLAI looks like. Um, the agenda for today looks like, you know, what, what, what are the machine learning trends, uh, you know, uh, an introduction to neural networks, which has kind of uh, become, come to the forefront of ML, uh, which, we, which is actually called deep learning, but now machine learning and deep learning are used interchangeably. Um, ML accelerated methods on vSphere, so when we talk about ML accelerators, we talk about potentially GPUs, uh, how GPUs can be leveraged on vSphere. We look at how the modern computing infrastructure looks like. Um, in, that includes, uh, you know, things like what is what is changing with uh, with with containers, Kubernetes, and uh, and and a mix of virtual machines. Uh, we look at the cluster architecture for MLI environments. Um, we do a sample design, and then we we then uh, go through the resources and the call to action. So now I'll pass it back to my colleague Justin to go, go with. Uh... So thank you, Mohan, thank you. So here's a statement from our CEO, Pat Gelsinger. Machine learning is the most important new workload to emerge in the enterprise in the last 10 years. That's pretty dramatic, and that's why we're paying attention to it, both of us and other people at VMware too. And really, um, it's, it's become part of almost every vertical industry. People are using machine learning in healthcare for medical imaging. People are using it in autonomous vehicles for understanding what the sensors are telling them in a, in a modern aut uh, autonomous vehicle. People are using it to predict churn on telecom applications. People are using it in finance to do fraud analysis and, and risk analysis. Um, you can think of machine learning as a component that's being used throughout the, the entire IT industry almost now and, and is growing very rapidly. Next slide, please. And as you, as you'll see, um, the revenue, expected revenue from the AI, just software alone, is on the uh, up to the right trajectory. So there's, there's a, a significant number of players in this business, a significant number of software companies, and we've, we've got relationships with many of those, and a significant number of hardware companies making GPUs and other devices that accelerate machine learning. I won't delve into this analysis. You can read this for yourself. It's, it's from Statista, uh, Statistica in 2020, but it shows very healthy growth in, in the machine learning market. Um, a lot of people are going after this. Uh, and we'll give you some of the reasons they're doing that. So my section coming up, next slide, please, Mohan. My, my section coming up, we'll talk about the ML algorithms a little bit, but the ML algorithms, as you saw with that diminishing orange box, is just one part of the machine learning landscape. Uh, this is, diagram is taken from a famous Google paper written by D. Scully on technical debt in machine learning. Well worth a read if you're introducing yourself to machine learning. But essentially what it says is the machine learning algorithms, the, the famous neural networks that we're going to talk about and how to accelerate them, 
that's one very important part of machine learning. There are other important parts though, like data collection, feature extraction, cleaning up the data in, in preparation for doing machine learning. And then there are other very important parts like machine resource management and serving infrastructure and monitoring uh, that we're not going to talk about today. We may talk about those at a future of VM Live, but those are very much part of the VMware responsibility as we see it. Machine resource management is what we've been doing for 20 years and serving infrastructure is also what we've been doing for that length of time. So we have a lot to contribute here as VMware. And also we're talking to many, many partners in the blue box area, data collection, analysis tools, feature extraction. That's a big ecosystem of partners that VMware's partnered with. We'll focus today, however, on the core ideas, the core, uh, what is machine learning and, and why, why GPUs, why accelerators, and, and why do those have an effect on the architecture? So next slide, please, Moa. Um, so machine learning operations has recently emerged as a, a field of big interest. And uh, one of the companies in that field is Data Robot. It's not the only company. There are other companies too, um, Algorithmia and other companies that we've partnered with. And this is the business of taking the machine learning deployment object, uh, a trained model, and making sure it's set up correctly in production. So making sure you have the right version, making sure you can replicate that version, making sure the machine learning model is not gone stale in time, that it's up to date. And that's a whole field in machine learning that's emerging as a big field, and VMware is playing in that field too. Next slide, please. So uh, neural networks are a specific topic. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Um, they are a core algorithm, not the only algorithm by any means, but as, as Mohan rightly said, they're a core algorithm in uh, machine learning and sometimes called artificial neural networks. And they're artificial in the sense that they're modeled on the human brain. The human brain has billions of neurons in it, which are connected via synapses and axons and other uh, biological uh, phenomena. The software equivalent that models this is, is called a neuron two, and it has multiple inputs. A, it has a matrix of inputs from other places in the brain, from other neurons. It does some calculations, matrix multiplication particularly, on those inputs, multiplies them by the weights in, indicated by W, and then sends them through a function called an activation function, which brings nonlinearity into the whole neural network. The, the core idea to remember here, there's a lot to this, I know, but the core idea to remember is that every single neuron is executing potentially millions of matrix multiplication operations and accumulating th that result into the sigma and sending it on to another neuron in the network. So every single neuron, and we're going to see hundreds of neurons in, in a network, neural network, is doing massive numbers of matrix multiplication. The matrix of inputs multiplied by the matrix of weights, to put it simply. And that matrix multiplication requires specialized hardware to drive it. And that specialized hardware is today a GPU. Uh, GPUs are hugely popular in this. And we're talking about this because this is a core fundamental piece of the architecture that you need to come to grips with in machine learning that you may not have met before. You may have met it before in high performance computing applications, but it's specifically needed for neural networks in uh, machine learning. Now, I mentioned that neural networks are not the only algorithm in machine learning. There are others like XGBoost, decision trees, logistic regression, more traditional classical statistical methods. But neural networks have really got the limelight in the past year on uh, big problems like image recognition, voice recognition, text, uh, handwriting recognition, that type of problem. So when you put hundreds of these neurons together into a, a collection, a connected connection, we call that a neural network. And that's on the next slide. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see a relatively simple neural network. You can think of an image being fed into this neural network for training purposes. And that image is broken up into pieces by the leftmost green dots. And then each piece is handed on to the next layer of neurons that you see in the middle. That's one of the hidden layers. And then the light green on to the right hand side of the network is the output layer. Where I have multiple hidden layers, as I have on the right hand side of this diagram, I have something called a deep neural network. A deep neural network is the classical model that people would go to if they had an image recognition problem or a voice, voice handling problem or 
other forms of problems which are very popularly addressed today in machine learning. So every one of those circles represents a neuron in the network, and every one of those circles is executing potentially hundreds of thousands or millions of matrix multiplications, as you've seen when we looked inside it. So matrix multiplication is being doing done by the millions in a, neur in a deep neural network like this. And classically, we talk about 150 layers in a ResNet network. A ResNet is a type of ne neural network. 150 layers is not unheard of at all. Uh, I'm showing three hidden layers here, but imagine this multiplied by 100. And now you have a very serious compute uh, requirement, and that's why GPUs are in the picture, because each neuron in any one layer here can execute on one of the thousands of cores in the GPU, uh, and that's what drives the architecture fundamentals of machine learning here. Next slide, please. So do GPUs really work with this? This is the Tesla V100, which up to recently was the high end of the, of the NVIDIA GPU range. Um, there are others like the T4, and now there's an A100 that's even bigger and faster than the Tesla V100 recently announced. But you can see here that the GPU multiplies the amount of processing that can be done by a factor of 30x, 35x, way faster. You know, it's an order of magnitude, if not two orders of magnitude faster than doing the same work on a CPU. Now, there are people building other hardware, FPGAs and ASICs, to accelerate this matrix multiplication in the millions problem. But GPUs really dominate the market here in 2020. And so we'll talk about those as a fundamental piece to consider in a machine learning architecture. And my colleague will go into the deeper concepts as we go ahead. Let's, let's, just, let's uh, get the GPU subject out of the way first. So as mentioned, there are other types of accelerators, uh, field programmable gate arrays and uh, uh, ASICs, which are specialized circuits. Uh, these are coming out now and many companies getting into this market. We're not going to talk about those today because really GPUs dominate the machine learning market. And so we're going to focus in on this and explain what architecture considerations you need to take into account when you're deciding on a reference architecture for machine learning, because GPUs are probably going to be there, most likely going to be there in your architecture. So next slide, please. So actually on VMware, there are three methods uh, that we talk about of doing GPUs in virtual machines. There's a direct path IO method, which as its name implies, is a pass-through mechanism for the GPU instructions that come out of the application and the drivers supporting that application directly to the hardware without the hypervisor getting in the middle. There's a virtual GPU concept from NVIDIA uh, jointly done with VMware, which presents a virtual GPU to the VM. And that virtual GPU could represent one half or one quarter of the physical GPU that's in the hardware underneath it. That's for local access to GPUs on the host on which the VM is running. And there is a third option, which is, you've probably heard about it, vSphere BitFusion, an acquisition by VMware, which allows you to use remote GPUs over the network. In this case, your application is running and it needs some CUDA power to drive it. And it makes a CUDA API call and that goes via the BitFusion agent over to a BitFusion server, executes on the CUDA hardware and the, and the GPU underneath it and comes back to the client. Now, all three of these have some pros and cons and we're going to briefly discuss these as background information to what Mohan is going to present, assuming you've chosen one or more of these methods in the second part of the talk. So direct path IO firstly, next slide please. So direct path IO, here's the flow of control on the left hand side. Your application is running on TensorFlow or PyTorch or CAFE or MXNet or some, some framework from a third party, more likely, more than likely an open source framework. And it's, it's executing there and it makes a call to this driver that you've built into your guest OS, which is a prerequisite for you to use the GPU called a CUDA driver. That's a piece of software from NVIDIA. CUDA is a standard that NVIDIA built for access to their devices, their GPU devices. And it's, it's pretty much pervasive in the industry wherever GPUs are, CUDA, are to, CUDA is too. So you need to insert that driver in your guest OS that gets the API call and effectively sends the CUDA call via the guest OS down into the GPU hardware and the result comes back 
without the hypervisor really touching it. The hypervisor is in pass-through or direct path I.O. mode. This is very easy to set up um, and is there in all flavors of vSphere. So it has some limitations. There are some reasons why you wouldn't use this, but um, this is there for, for every uh, vSphere version that you would, want, you would care to use um, a GPU on. Next slide, please. So the pros and cons of this. Um, a, a distinct pro is that with a pass-through or direct path I.O. setup, you're going to get performance of your application that's very close to native performance, physical performance. Uh, the hypervisor is not getting in the way. It's not really interfering in the performance at all. This is native to all vSphere editions. It's pretty easy to deploy. You turn a few switches on, and there are blog articles about how to do this, and it becomes second nature to do it after a while. It has some capability in the HA and DRS initial placement area. That's a new feature called hardware assignment uh, in vSphere 7 that allows DRS to place your VM onto an appropriate host on which there is the appropriate GPU. It doesn't do any more than that other than placement right now, but um, you can have multiple GPUs in your VM. Some data scientists will come to you and say, I need two GPUs to execute this me medical imaging inference that I'm doing, very high-end uh, machine learning stuff, four GPUs even. All of that's possible with pass-through. Um, the VM owns the GPU when it's passed through. The VM has complete access to the GPU owns the whole thing, no fractional GPU allowed, no snapshots, no vMotion. And it's possible with this that your application runs for a certain number of hours of the day, and then the GPU is not occupied by anybody else for the rest of the day. So you could have underutilization with this. That's a distinct con uh, to do with direct path IO. So let's move on to the next method now. Uh, NVIDIA Virtual GPU is a collection of products. Some of them are desktop products, some of them are server-side products. The Virtual Compute Server is one software product within the vGPU family that came out in uh, 2019. It's current in 2020. Um, and it is the specific software product that you would license from NVIDIA to drive virtual GPUs. Next slide, please. So in, in this situation, you have two components. You have your CUDA driver. This is a specific driver now for virtual GPUs. And you also have a, a, a module or a manager or a VIB that you need to put into the ESX hypervisor. You use a VIB install command to do this. And both components should be of the same version and subversion if you, if you can. They, they need to be compatible with each other. But effectively, what you get when you install that NVIDIA vGPU manager into ESXi is you get a set of profiles of different shapes and sizes of virtual GPU. A virtual GPU that takes up half of the physical memory or a virtual GPU that takes up one quarter of the physical memory of your, of your real GPU at the bottom. And you can have multiple GPUs with this as well. And now what you're doing is you're sharing the physical GPU across more than one VM so that each VM has one half or one quarter of the physical GPU's memory. And that's very powerful because you can now vMotion this virtual machine from one host to the other, provided that the target host has got the right software on it and the right hardware on it. So the application makes its call to TensorFlow and says, I need GPU power for this one operation I'm doing. It happens to have a virtual GPU profile associated with it, so it's really only using half of the physical GPU. And the GPU request is sent via the, the driver down to the GPU manager and then down to the hardware by that. And the GPU manager is multiplexing access to the physical GPUs from the various VMs that are sharing it. You don't have to share with this, by the way. You could dedicate, dedicate the entire physical GPU to one VM or more than one entire physical GPU to a VM. You could do that. You, you could satisfy your high-end data scientist who wants more than one GPU. But more traditionally, this is used where you want to split a physical GPU across two or more VMs. Next slide, please. So the pros and cons here are, this is close to direct path IO performance within a few percent of it. You now have vMotion, which is a huge benefit because you don't always want to run your GPU using applications on the same host. You might want to move them around. You've also got DRS to help you with placing this VM onto the right host at initial placement time. That's um, uh, assignable hardware in vSphere 7. You can suspend your VM and resume it later. 
You can give somebody a fraction of a GPU, as I mentioned, one eighth, one quarter, one half. All the fractions on one host must be the same size, by the way, but you can do fractions of a GPU. You can do multiple GPUs, up to four physical GPUs assigned to the same VM. That's not a problem. And when you assign multiple GPUs, you're going to assign all of their memory to the same VM. So that's, that's a fairly high-end requirement there. And you can use different scheduling algorithms to optimize the use of the GPU. And, and this is going to really take off in the next year or so as new technology comes out from NVIDIA underlying all this called uh, multi-instance GPUs. And we won't delve into that here today, but essentially both algorithms allow you to share the physical GPU across different uh, parties. Some of the cons of this is you need to get a license for it and, and have a license server that allows you to use the license. So you, there is some cost associated with it. It requires you to shut down your host or place, place it into maintenance mode to install the VIB. So your VMs have to be evacuated for that process to happen. Your guest OS vGPU driver must match the version of the vGPU manager. You need to take care of that. And setting up a vGPU profile is a pretty static process until you re reinitialize that VM. If you're going to change the vGPU profile, you're really going to take the VM down for a while, change the profile and bring it back up again. So it's not dynamic in that sense. And fractional GPUs on any one server must all be the same memory size. And really this is for NVIDIA GPUs, which is the majority of the market right now. So next, next slide, please. So last option here in the GPU space, and we're going to go up a level from this in the next section, but Bitfusion was acquired by VMware in 2019 and is now built into vSphere Enterprise at the 7.x release. 7.0 is out there already, of course. Um, and next slide, please. So what Bitfusion does is takes a bunch of virtual machines on the left-hand side that are running applications. They're running in containers. They're running with Kubernetes. They don't have any GPU hardware on their host servers. And they're making calls across the local network in your data center to other VMs on the right-hand side, which those VMs control the GPU server pool. Those VMs have direct path access to their physical GPUs that they own. And they are offering up those GPUs to clients on the left, either in shared form or in multiple GPU form to be used for specific uh, parts of an application. You can, reserve an, uh, you can reserve a GPU for a long period of time, create a session if you like, or you can just say, I want to use the GPU for the period of this, this part of my application, and then I'm giving it back into the pool. So this is remote shared access to GPUs that are being pooled together. And this is a fundamental design that we think is very valuable to people building machine learning applications because not all machine learning applications need a full GPU and not all machine learning applications need multiple full GPUs. There are lots of, lots of cases, inference in particular, where you might just need part of a GPU for that job. Next slide, please. So Bitfusion works in this way. Your application running on TensorFlow, PyTorch, or whatever uh, framework you choose to use is going to execute a CUDA call saying, I want this following logic to execute on a GPU. That, get, that CUDA call gets intercepted and picked up by a Bitfusion agent that's running on the client side at the top here. The Bitfusion agent recognizes CUDA API calls, intercepts them, and does various optimizations on them before they get sent over the network to a Bitfusion server. On the Bitfusion server side, you effectively have pass-through access now to your GPU at the bottom. Uh, that Bitfusion server is going to take a slice of, of the GPU that you've requested, one third, one fifth, one half, one quarter of a GPU, and allocate that to you for a period of time and then take it back once you've relinquished that access. You can keep the access for a long period of time for the entire length of your application if you want to, but you can also decide I'm just going to use it for specific CUDA calls and, and render the GPU available again. So GP, the, the, the CUDA calls that are inherent to use of GPUs are intercepted by Bitfusion on the client side and remoted over or passed over to a server that executes them for you and sends back the result to the right client. So this is very powerful stuff in that you can have hundreds of clients like the VMs on the top, which make use of a small number of servers, a dozen, 
or, or so servers and make optimal, optimal utilization and efficiency of your GPU the prime, the prime driver here for all of this. That's, that's how you would do this. And this is quite different to the previous methods because here the GPUs are not on the server that I'm executing my client on. They're remote from it. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over now to my colleague Mohan on the next slide. Oh, before we do that, let's do the pros and cons of this. So um, this is native to vSphere Enterprise Plus. You turn it on, you enable BitFusion uh, at the vCenter level. You effectively have on-demand access to GPUs over the network. Um, on, on the other side of the network, there's a shared GPU cluster running these BitFusion servers, and you can access more than one of these BitFusion servers by putting its IP address or its host name into a configuration file, and therefore you can use different servers if you can't find what you want on the original one. You can use multiple GPUs in this way. Um, classically today, multiple GPUs come from the same server when you ask for them. Uh, over the network. The multi you're not doing GPU mixing from different servers here. You're, if you're accessing multiple GPUs at once, they all come from the same server. You have the ability to do HA, DRS, and vMotion of your client VMs because they're not tied to any hardware. They can execute anywhere in your network. And the CUDA API calls are optimized uh, underlying this model they're not just being sent straight across the network, they're being batched up and optimized and, uh, and configured for high performance as they go across the network. Of course, this is very network dependent um, and uh, network latency is a, is a key part of all this. And uh, this is for GPUs only at the moment, but the team in the engineering team on Bitfusion is working on FPGAs and ASICs and that, those are on the roadmap for future, future work. Okay, so those are your three methods. This is some BitFusion user interface uh, that you see in, in vCenter. I won't dwell on this, but it shows you what your servers are doing, what your clients are doing, where your servers are serving up the GPU power to your clients, and you can watch your GPU allocation over time. This is really a GPU optimization method. And one last point, uh, lots of people who deal with GPUs every day uh, are interested in the NVLink technology, which allows two physical GPUs to share memory, share data over a, a set of hardware traces. This is supported on vSphere. What we say to you is, if you have NV links between two GPUs, which is really a hardware link between those GPUs, allocate those two GPUs to the same virtual machine so that any data being shared by the GPUs is really owned by that VM. Uh, there's another form of this that carries the data over PCI peer-to-peer -peer. Uh, that works on VMware, but we don't support it. Uh, the data would actually go through the CPU and that's something you want to avoid. NVLink, that doesn't happen. And that's a very popular subject in GPU architecture. So that's the end of the deep dive into GPUs. Now we're going to go to the architecture level with Mohan and I'll hand it over to him. Thanks, Justin. So now we look at modern computer infrastructures and see uh, how you know um, we can architect a solution leveraging all the capabilities that uh, Justin had mentioned on vSphere, uh, along with all the new capabilities. So, for example, now uh, you know we have a interaction of all these different components nowadays in our modern infrastructure. It's a mix of different components that includes virtual machines. Kubernetes pods, serverless functions, all these things are intermingled and all these components want access to all the different capabilities that the hardware provides. And so like off late Kubernetes is more prevalent. And so, um, so we need to be able to provide an infrastructure that supports all these different components. And so uh, VMware vSphere 7 um, uh, with VMware Cloud Foundation 4, uh, empowers IT operators and uh, developers to be able to uh, kind of leverage a vSphere environment. Uh, traditionally, vSphere has been uh, virtual machines only, and now with vSphere 7, we, we provide, we make uh, Kubernetes a first class citizen, and uh, we have uh, leveraged Kubernetes and re architected vSphere and extended its capabilities so that all modern applications and traditional applications can interact and use the same infrastructure. So 
some of the main uh, Kubernetes innovations include uh, the, the uni unite, uniting of vSphere and Kubernetes. Uh, we are able to leverage uh, Kubernetes uh, clusters on top of vSphere. Kubernetes can run inside the hypervisor itself and also on top of it uh, in the in form of guest clusters. So these are all, uh, these are a lot of concepts which we don't want to go too deep into, but we just, I just want to brush by it so that you know that, you know, with vSphere 7, we, we bring in the capabilities to support modern apps as well as we, uh, uh, we support the traditional apps, right? So now how do we take all these components and build an AI ML cluster? So now we'll look at some of the, the components uh, on how uh, a cluster is designed. So in, the, in, in, in traditional terms, if you think about how VMware came about, we, we virtualized CPUs we we realized that a lot of the CPUs were underutilized, and then we we said that okay, let's bring them all together, uh, centralize the infrastructure, and then we pro then we allocate the CPUs based on user requirements. The same concept we apply we would apply to the GPU because GPUs are pretty expensive; they could ask, they cost as much as a server sometimes, and so you want to be able to aggregate your GPUs so that your users can use it uh, and share it at the same time, rather than um, in traditionally like, uh, like CPUs, GPUs are also like dedicated to users and that uh, companies have seen that have caused a lot of underutilization and uh, excessive cost. So uh, we want to leverage vSphere to kind of um, provide the ability to aggregate and share these GPUs across multiple users. So all in, uh, here we show you uh, uh, a typical uh, GPU cluster. What, what do we call, what, what is the GPU cluster is where we actually aggregate all the servers containing GPUs or, and lever, install all the GPUs in an even manner across all the nodes in the cluster. And then uh, we kind of, initially we do a requirement analysis on the, all the use cases that customers potentially have, maybe some, some data scientists like Justin mentioned might need four GPUs, uh, some, some developers would need a fraction of a GPU. So we kind of take all these use cases and look at, okay, what is the maximum number of GPUs that I need per server? And then based on that, I would, uh, I would, we would design a cluster which is with, with uh, with the requisite number of servers and, and the number of GPUs that meets the overall need of all the users in the environment. So here we show you, uh, you know, a GPU cluster. We're using NVIDIA vCompute server as the foundation, where uh, where the GPUs are are, sh are shared using vCompute server. But uh, we can also leverage other technologies like uh, BitFusion by uh, layering that on top of the compute server. So now let's look at the common need for vGPUs as shown. I'm showing you the common GPU use cases. This might vary in your organization, um, uh, but you know, here we're saying, okay, I need uh, a full GPU dedicated to a data science workstation user. Sometimes I have uh, some, works, some users requiring multiple GPUs. Uh, so that is, a, that is a also a use case. Sometimes like uh, developers and other small applications or inference applications might require uh, partial GPUs. And then we want the ability to have full or partial GPUs for uh, things like distributed TensorFlow or Horovod, which provide the capability to have multiple workers do the job of uh, distributing the machine learning and then do kind of uh, share the resources and um, distribute the computation. So that is kind of an upcoming trend. And so if you look at the building blocks, what, what do we have here? Now uh, we have the, the, the latest uh, NVIDIA accelerators, which include the V100, uh, the A100 is the one that was announced uh, a couple of months ago. And, uh, and the, the, the T4 is a little bit of a lower uh, profile GPU, but it, it is, is used more for inference and it, it doesn't require any special power 
The V100s and the A100s typically require more power, so you would need a server with a lot more uh, power, uh, power capacity as well as uh, special cabling for the GPU to perform. In the case of a T4, you don't need that. And then we have uh, things like the Mel Mellanox and Connect X5 uh, or X6, which are, is the latest version of Mellanox, which kind of provides you high performance computing, high performance networking, so that in cases where you're using distributed computing or you're using BitFusion, or where the actual GPU, GPUs are accessed over the network, uh, high-speed networking would really provide better performance, right? And so, and uh, from a software perspective, we would be leveraging VMware vCloud Foundation. Um, the TKG stands for the Tansu Kubernetes Grid, which is the guest clusters that are available at vSphere 7. NSX provides the networking for Kubernetes and for uh, workloads. Uh, vSphere BitFusion provides you the uh, ability to share the cluster. And then we have NVIDIA can be compute server, Mellanox software, and things like uh, HashiCorp Terraform for automation. And then you look at, uh, from a, a networking standpoint, uh, ideally we should have a minimum of 25 gig networking, but you know, it could go all the way to 100 gig with, uh, to, to make sure that your latency and throughput are maximized for distributed machine learning and bit fusion. And like storage, like example storage from uh, Dell shown here, uh, and then you have uh, the frameworks that we typically deploy. So if you look at uh, if a typical enterprise machine learning cluster design, these are the steps that we would need to follow. We need to define the use cases, who are the users and how, they, how do they intend to use the cluster. And we, uh, we need to do a capacity assessment based on what is being used across the enterprise and, uh, on, and we're gonna hopefully centralize all these use cases and the users, you would need to know how many GPUs do you need, at a time, and then how, uh, what, what kind of uh, capacity does the cluster need to have from a GPU standpoint and a CPU and a memory standpoint include, and maybe also look at the networking needs of the infrastructure. Then we use the, based on this, you would look at what the typical hardware building blocks would be. Depending on who your server vendor is for your enterprise, you would, you would choose the appropriate hardware that supports GPUs and uh, supports the capabilities to have multiple GPUs. And then you would kind of uh, design a cluster based on all of this for resiliency and high performance. And then based on, uh, finally, you would implement optimized automation and optimize your GP use of GPU infrastructure. So kind of this is, these are the steps that we would follow. And then let's go through these steps through, let's go through a sample design so that you would understand what it takes to design such an infrastructure. So. The first thing is, okay, we have uh, uh, the user type, right? So the, we have a high performance users with, who need a maximum of four GPUs. So we've, we've done a, a survey within our company and we see that uh, there are some high performance researchers that require a maximum of four GPUs. So we need to make sure whatever design we, we do, the, the, there is, uh, the, the server has four GPUs available. Then we have, some, we have found that there are some data scientists that need full or partial GPUs for their, uh, for their uh, analysis. We have some HPC users that need full or partial GPUs. We have some developers that require full or partial GPUs. And then last but not the least, we have distributed machine learning users with need for GPU requ requ resources that go across multiple worker nodes. So these are the user types we've decided on. We, we, we did the survey and these are the types of users that we're gonna be servicing. And then one of the main, main requirements that comes out of this is that um, the server should support a maximum of four GPUs so that some of the user types are supported. So now let's look at the use cases, right? For high performance researchers, uh, since uh, we don't want any traffic going over the network, we would uh, le leverage the NVIDIA vGPU. We did, we did uh, Justin showed you three different ways of accessing GPUs. We are not going through pass-through here because pass-through is not a good mechanism for sharing. So we look at these different users and what technology applies. So for the high performance researcher, we're gonna use NVIDIA vGPU. For the data scientists, we could either use NVIDIA vGPU or VMware BitFusion. For the HPC users uh, also requiring uh, you know, high, high, low latency connectivity, 
through the GPUs, we would use NVIDIA vGPU. And then for the developers, we would use VMware Bitfusion. And last but not the least, uh, the distributed machine learning, we can either use vGPU or Bitfusion. So now we've mapped our users to these different uh, access methodologies. So now let's look at the cluster design. So the cluster design, we uh, based on our requirements, we need to have each physical node will have four GPUs each to meet the needs of the high performance researchers. So as we saw in the earlier uh, requirements analysis that uh, four GPUs are required per node. And then we, uh, based on our capacity assessment, uh, we, uh, we found that uh, up to 28 GPUs are needed. And then, uh, so for this 24, 28 GPUs with the, uh, with, for seven hosts, we would need at least seven hosts with four GPU each. But whenever we do VMware design, we would always need to provide uh, additional capacity for maintenance and high availability. So an additional host is required for that. So we would, uh, we would add an additional host. You could actually add one more node to kind of uh, have HA capacity when you do maintenance, but that would be too expensive in the situation because uh, GPUs cost a lot of money and you have four GPUs per node. So we, in this case, we are doing a, an N plus one design rather than N plus two design, which is also common. Then the cluster would use eight nodes with four GPUs each, the total capacity available of 32 GPUs under normal circumstances. But when you do any maintenance or if there's a HA uh, event where you lose a node, you could, you could go down to seven, seven hosts and you still are, have the 28 GPU capacity. All GPUs in the cluster would be made through the NVIDIA vCompute server. The vCompute server would be the basis. And from there, even, even a bit fusion that would be part of the cluster would be using the vCompute server as a, would be allocated GPUs through the vCompute server. So, and then, and then, so now let's look at how uh, this cluster looks like, right? So we have uh, for the hype of the, the GPU cluster, this is how it looks like. The logical components looks like you have, uh, in this cluster, we have VMs representing the high performance researchers. And so you have some VMs representing the bit fusion server virtual machines. Both of them are using NVIDIA vGPUs for accessing, uh, accessing the GPUs. The high performance uh, researchers have ac direct access to the GPUs through the vGPU, whereas the Bitfusion servers uh, are gonna have access to the vGPU and then they would be serv serving the Bitfusion clients over the network. So you see, that's why you see these two different uh, blocks out here, uh, seg segregating these different virtual machines, but these, these different blocks actually serve different use cases. So now how does it look, right? And if you look at it, if we bring it all together, uh, in the left-hand side here, you see uh, all the different compute uh, clusters available. And uh, you know, there, are, uh, there are some use cases that leverage these, uh, there, are, there are compute clusters in your environment that are actually connected via the network to the GPU cluster we showed in the previous slide. So high performance researchers would be using the, uh, the, 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 the GPUs directly. Bitfusion would be leveraged to use uh, the cluster over the network. And we, here you see developers using Kubernetes and other users using different kinds of uh, VMs to access the, the, the GPU resources over the network. And then and, and overall you see how all of this uh, kind of, um, all the other capabilities of vSphere and VCF are brought to fray. So you have this, uh, this block in the middle and, on, and all the other capabilities that vSphere has can be uh, layered on top to provide you a, a very robust, you know, modern compute infrastructure. So now, uh, now that we've seen the design and, the, and, the care and all the components relating to it, uh, let's summarize as we're running out of time. Um, so first, we, we showed you that uh, uh, VMware infrastructure is a, provides you a solid framework with software-defined compute, storage, and networking. Justin had gone through all the capabilities and how we support uh, GPUs and other uh, GPUs and, and different methods to access it. And you, you, we saw that uh, NVIDIA vGPUs uh, can be leveraged uh, to provide high-performance computing access to the GPUs with uh, Veeam Motion and DRS capabilities. 
uh, we see that vSphere Bitfusion can provide the ability to access the GPU resources over the network uh, for uh, different user needs. And then last but not the least, we looked at the sample cluster design that showed the flexibility of the solution to accommodate all the common GPU use cases you would have in your enterprise. And, to, and finally, we just wanted to show you uh, the resources that uh, we have that you can leverage, um, leverage for um, uh, where all the, we've written a lot of blogs. I and Justin write a, blog, a lot of blog articles and papers. All these are shown in uh, the, these links here. So please leverage these to kind of uh, um, look at look at uh, look at all the latest uh, research and the work that we've done in these areas.